Hello there, and thank you for watching this video on YouTube. Welcome to the Demola Olaiwaju YouTube channel. Um, so I wanted to make this video to address um, reactions, which I think, you know, are quite legitimate in as much as I think that the 2015 election, um, it has come and gone, but, you know, it was a landmark election in Nigeria. It is an election that has set the trajectory of Nigeria. Um, politically, you know, the good luck, Jonathan versus Mama Dubwari um, election, and um, you know, there are always lessons to learn from it, you know, <clears throat> even though it is, it has been six years now since that election has held, um, but there are still lessons to learn from it, and one of the things that people have um, raised, you know, in recent times, one of the questions people have raised is, um, why does it seem like um, PDP folks or people who supported Good Luck Jonathan in 2015, why are they upset, so to speak, with um, young people of our generation who supported uh, Muhammadu Buhari, um, but they are not that upset with um, 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 the likes of Atiku Abubakar, the likes of Bukola Saraki, Rabi Ukwakwansu, and the rest of them, you know, I mean, Utambuwal, who supported um, or who were more politically influential and who supported um, Muhammadu Buhari also in 2015. And I think, you know, it's a logical question to ask. Um, and, you know, for the sake of those of us who supported Good Luck Jonathan at that time or who support PDP now, it's always important to remind ourselves of the political history that led to our choice um, for us to that that brought us to that point you know um, uh, you know so it's something that we have to examine and ensure that there's no logical inconsistency so um, personally I, I this is my own um, recollection of how things played out um, it's my own look at history at the history of it and why I can sometimes find myself working with a Rabi Okwakwanso or working with a Bukola Saraki or an Aminu Tambuwal or an Atiku Abubaka, all of whom left the PDP and supported uh, Mama Dubari and helped him to become president. And I think, you know, straight away, the first reason that occurs to me is that these guys um, left before 2015, um, but when they realized, you know, the task that was before them, they did not go looking for um, options that are not pragmatic. They looked for the best options and they were humble enough, so to speak, to retrace their steps back to the People's Democratic Party, back to the good luck Jonathan they rejected in 2015, um, in order to walk to unseat Muhammad Dubuari. Now, the bulk of the people in my generation who supported Muhammad Dubuari to become president in 2015 when they realized that he was a disaster before 2019, they took one of two or three options. Um, they, they either, you know, kept quiet, you know, throughout the 2019 election period. Um, they were not motiv um, 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 mobilizing people online as much as um, they had mobilized against Good Luck Jonathan, which is acceptable. It might have been biased remorse, might have been a feeling of um, they don't want to make a mistake again politically. Oh, and then the other option that they took was that some of them started working for third force options, um, options that were clearly not pragmatic enough to defeat Buhari or to remove the APC from power. In other words, these were people who in 2015 had, they could work with the APC to unseat the PDP, but by 2019 when it became clear that the APC had become a disaster, rather than unite with the PDP to unseat the APC as the only pragmatic option, most of them went for third force options or kept quiet. I do not know so many of them who are prominent who, you know, embraced PDP wholeheartedly and said, let's just do whatever we have to do to, you know, get rid of the disaster that we brought in in 2015. Now, this is different from the political stance of the likes of Bukola Saraki, the likes of Atiku Abubakar, and the rest of them. They retraced their steps. I mean, even someone like former President Olusha Gombasodro, who had vowed, you know, never to forgive um, Atiku Abubakar, felt, you know, look, we brought a problem. 
we've retraced our steps back to the PDP. If supporting Atiku is going to unseat Muhammadu Buhari, then I will do that. And that's the pragmatism of politics, okay? Which, you know, which um, in my mind, it also explains why someone like Atiku Abubakar, I can in all good conscience, I could have in all good conscience um, support someone like Atiku Abubakar as at 2019 for president, despite the fact that he had walked to unseat Goodluck Jonathan, which was against the political stand that I took as at 2015. Now, in Atiku Abubakar's case, you know, I fully understand that um, the trajectory of, of, of his politics has been such that he has been more sinned against, against more sinned against, rather than um, he sinning against others, so to speak. In other words, if you look at the trajectory of his political career, you would realize that, you know, um, 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 his defection, his defection in 2015, it was only um, natural. And before I say, before I explain what I want to take some time, about um, 30 minutes in total, to explain, I should point out two things. Um, first of all, is that politics, for some of us, it's a game or it's an engagement of ideology. In other words, what we believe in is what we stand by regardless of um regardless of where it leads us to okay if our political thoughts if our political ideals lead us to supporting good luck jonathan then we will do that whether we like him or not um and uh if it leads us to anybody else you know we support whoever it is but at a certain point in politics politics also becomes an engagement of aspiration and ambition in other words, politics is first an engagement of ideology, and then at the other side, you have politics as an engagement of, of um, aspiration or ambition. In other words, I as a young politician have some things that I believe, you know, I can offer to my society. So if I go after an office, I do not get it. Like, and then it's promised me the next time, you know, and then, you know, I keep on experiencing political betrayals. Mm, politics as an engagement of ideology would want to keep me within that political circle, um, you know, where I've been betrayed, where my ambition has been put down. But then the politics of aspiration and ambition, in other words, the fact that I believe that I have a right to aspire for this, I have a right to be ambitious in this regard, um, then I can take steps, you know, out of that engagement of ideology to move into the realm of the engagement of aspiration and pursue my um, political aspirations elsewhere. Now, people use everything possible in um, politics to try and discredit your ambition. And again, it is what it is in politics. In other words, if I am tall and my opponent is short, um, and the last three people who had occupied a certain position, the position we are contesting for, if those last three people had been shot also, I would say, look, it's time for us to vote for a tall man, um, which I am. So I make arguments that um, um, favor my interest, okay, that favor my qualifications or that favor my strong points. Um, and it is also used against you. In other words, your opponents are also trying to discredit you on the basis of what they have and you do not have. So if your opponent is a woman and she realizes it is that the, 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 the overriding sentiment in society at that time is for a woman to win, she starts to bring up, you know, slogans and um, arguments in that regard, saying that, look, it's time for a woman to get it because she has that um, advantage over you within that political field. Now, when people use that against you, you have a right or you have a... A, a, a duty, so to speak, to protect your aspiration by seeking your ambition elsewhere. The nutshell is if you are in a political circle where your aspiration is not being aided, you can determine it in some other um, 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 political association or you can move out of that political association in protest or you can stay within that political association but not fully engage. Um, in you know actively supporting or actively participating anymore because you know I mean at the end of the day we are humans and so um, when things are done to us you know we, we, we get upset and we we, we we do what's best you know for ourselves so that trajectory is there and then you know the second thing I wanted to say before I get into um, the purpose of this video is that look I, I quite understand the 
um, the prevailing thought of some people who would believe that, oh, um, you know, these people are saying this or this person is saying this because um, for whatever reason and so on and so forth. The truth is that, you know, I see myself as beholding to certain people. Some of those who follow me who follow my political thoughts. And I always feel that we owe them a duty um, to lead thought in, in regards to showing them how we think or showing them how we arrive at the political decisions that we arrive at. So now that there is a question um, out there that how are you able to support the likes of Atiku, to support the likes of Saraki and so on, who supported Muhammad Dubwari, but you are against people of your generation or some of you, you know, come at them, um, holding them responsible for Muhammad, for Muhammad Dubwari. Um, so I think, you know, I feel that I owe that responsibility to people who look up to me to um, shine light on some of these things so that they understand what is going on. And this has nothing to do with the person of Atiku Abubakar. At the end of the day, this might serve, this might, you know, be beneficial to him, but it's not really the end goal. The end goal here is to lead thought in regards to guiding our people politically and also to shine light on the political trajectory that brought Nigeria to where Nigeria is. So, talking about um, Atiku Abubakar, he started his political journey in the Social Democratic Party in the Third Republic that was under the um, head of state military regime, the military presidency of um, General Ibrahim Badamosi Babangida, IBB. Now, there were two political parties at that time. There was the SDP, Social Democratic Party, and then there was the NRC, which was the National Republican Convention. Um, the biggest um, political bloc in the SDP at that time was led by General Shehu Musa Yaradua. That political bloc was called People's Democratic Movement, it was also called the People's Front, People's Frontier, People's Front, I believe it was either PF or PDM at that time. And they were the biggest bloc in the SDP. They had produced the chairman of the SDP, who was Babagana Kingibe. But Babagana Kingibe had fallen out with um, Major General Sheo Musa Yaradua. Um, Sheo Musa Yaradua was contesting for president, he was one of the big wigs at that time. Um, there were there were a lot a number of them. Francis Atul Nzeribe was also contesting. Um, Olabi Iduro Jaye, who eventually became um, a senator from Ogun State, he was also there. Chifolu Falaye was also there. Um, I believe uh, Iwayangu Emmanuel Iwayangu was also there. Um, you know Adamushi Roma from the north was also there. Umaru Shinkafi, they were in the NRC, and you know they had contested and done everything they wanted. And then IBB at some point said, look. Is disqualifying all 23 presidential aspirants, and all 23 of them were disqualified from that race. Um, initially, Atiku Abubakar was running to become the governor of Adamawa State. Um, he and a man called Balatakaya were the two top contenders, and their political contest was so fierce that eventually um, they were disqualified from the race by the IBB regime. So, having been disqualified from running for governor, um, his political mentor, General Shehu Musa Yadua, also haven't been disqualified from running for president, um, drafted him into the race and said, Atiku, come and run for president using my clout or my political clout, so to speak. And that was the um, situation of play at the time. So Atiku Abubakar came into the presidential race and from um, there were now three top contenders. There was um, Chief M.K. Wabiola, there was um, Babagana Kingibe, and then there was Atiku Abubakar running on the machinery of Shehu Musa Yaradua. Now, by the time they got to the Just Convention and they went for the first round of the race, M.K. Wabiola had the highest number of votes, Kingibe had number two, um, number three was Atiku Abubakar. Before they went for the second round, there was um, a bit of horse trading. I remember, that, you know, um, from history, of course, not that I was there, but I remember from history that um, Chief Lamidia Didibu, who had supported Shio Musa Yadra when Yadra was initially in the presidential race, who had supported him and helped him to deliver Oyo State, I believe, he had helped him to deliver Oyo State votes when, you know, before the 23 of them were initially banned. Lamidia Didibu was the one who brokered that um, discussion between MK Wabiola and Shio Musa Yadra that, look, why not pull out, pull your man out, pull Atiku Abubakar out, um, let Abiola win. When Abiola wins, Abiola will pick Atiku Abubakar as his running mate and, you know, and that just ends it. 
Now, it was a major political blow for Atuka Abubaka because, of course, he had invested himself into that political contest and he was looking forward to the second round of that politics. But unfortunately, he was prevailed upon. Um, some say that it was a tearful conversation, but eventually he pulled out. He went to the convention ground and announced that, you know, he was pulling out and his supporters should, should vote for uh, MK Wabiola instead. Everywhere went wild. A lot of people from the north felt that they had sold the north out to the south or to the southwest, so to speak. But in any case, they went into that contest. Abiola defeated King Gibe. Now, um, um, but King Gibe was backed by governors within the SDP because, of course, King Gibe was the former chairman of the party um, and, had, and he had helped many of the governors then in office on the SDP platform to become governors. And so they supported him. Now, these governors went to Abiola and said, look, now you've won the ticket. This is who we want to be your running mate, which is Babagana King Gibe. And so Abiola picked Babagana King Gibe rather than picking Atiku Abubakar as his vice president as, um, as was agreed. Now, this was the first political betrayal, so to speak, that Atiku felt that Atiku um, suffered in politics. He wasn't picked. Regardless, you know, they worked for the party, and MK Wabiola won in many states across the north based on Shehu Musaya Adwa's influence. The candidate of the NRC was Bashir Utmantofa. Bashir Utmantofa was from Kano State. MK Wabiola won in Kano State because they had supported him. So they supported him regardless of that. Now, the next political betrayal that was to come to Atiku Abubakar, from my own perspective, um, was after the eight year tenure of Chief Olusha Gobasanjo. Olusha Gobasanjo had been released from prison. The military generals wanted him, but they needed a political rallying point to help him to win. Now, um, students of political history will remember that as of as 1999, 98 to 1999, um, Dr. Alex Ekweme was expected to become the PDP presidential candidate. Um, all of a sudden, Obasanjo was in the mix. The military generals wanted him, uh, but he needed a political base. Now, the political base that he, 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 he got, the political base that was available to him, was that of his friend, um, Sheo Musaya Adwa. Sheo Musaya Adwa had been imprisoned by the Abacha regime, which followed the IBB regime. Um, he had been in prison along with Obasanjo, and then Sheo Musaya Adwa had died. And so, out of a feeling of friendship for Sheo Musaya Adwa, and also out of a need to have a political base, Obasanjo decided to choose Atiku Abubakar as his running mate. Of course, Atiku Abubakar mobilized for him to win that convention. Atiku Abubakar adopted him. Um, General Aliu Gusau was one of the key people that the military sent and they negotiated with Atiku Abubakar to deliver the PDM for him. The PDM was um, Sheo Musaya Adwa's political family, which was now being led by Atiku Abubakar. And you had the likes of Chief Tony Aneni, you had the likes of Lawal Kaita, you had the likes of Angu Abdullahi, you had the likes of um, um, Dubem Onya, you had Titi Ajanoku, you had Sunday Afolabi, you had so many people all over the country. Now, Atiku Abubakar helped deliver that power block to um, General Olusha Gwambasojo at the time, and they won the um, PDP primaries, and they eventually went on to win the presidency. Interestingly, Atiku Abubakar had, had been slated to, 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 to run on the platform of PDP for governor in Adamawa State. I think, as a matter of fact, that he had become governor, I believe. Um, I'm not so sure. I would have to check, check my, uh, my library records. But, but I think, you know, he had either become president, but whatever it was, I mean, Atiku Abubakar had to vacate, you know, being governor-elect, um, and his running mate was supposed to take over. But the politics of Adamawa is such that um, there's a Muslim population and there's a Christian population. So his deputy was a Christian, um, Boni Aruno. Now, when Boni Aruno became, became, um, was to become the governor-elect, um, a lot of people, a lot of people within the Adamawa political class were against um, Boni Aruno becoming the governor because, I mean, he's a Christian. Um, Muslims usually become governors in Adamawa than the Christian, which is slightly less than, which is a bit less than um, the Muslim population, you know, they are the running mates sometimes. Sometimes you have a Muslim Muslim ticket, but the sizable Christian population. Now, Atika Abubakar ensured that, you know, um, uh, um, Boni Haruna became the governor. A lot of people within the Adamawa political class don't like him for that reason. Um, as a matter of fact, some people believe that um, 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 Alaji Bamanga Tuko was one of those people. He wanted his son to replace Atika Abubakar on that ticket instead, and then Boni Haruna. And the whole thing was. 
a very elaborate um, political um, political play you know someone would resign and then someone would take over the ticket and then you know someone would become deputy governor and then someone would resign as governor and then someone the deputy governor would become the governor and then the deputy governor the deputy governor who had now become the governor would now appoint that person as his deputy and so on and so forth all to ensure but i think Abubaka supported um, Boniaru not to become governor. Boniaru not went on to become um, 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 governor of Adamawa State as the first Christian governor of Adamawa State for eight years. Again, this was in Atika Abubakar's records with the North. Okay, now at in the middle of Abbasanjo's term, um, which you know I don't really want to get into that, but in the middle of his term as of 2003, a lot of people in the polity, and I believe it is true, um, I've spoken with some of the major players at that time, and they said it was true. Um, Obasanjo had a one-time agreement with the North. He was supposed to serve for four years and then to leave the stage for a Northerner to take over. But Obasanjo wanted a second term and he was smart enough to know how to play the North. Um, he, he had a lot of young people in the North who were rooting for him. The likes of Yonu Ribadu, the likes of your Erufai, the likes of Atuka Abaka himself, the likes of Suli Lamido, Rabiu Kwakwanso, um, Ahmed Makafi. You know, he had all these guys all over the North who were his strong men. Now, in order to... now. Nobody knows whether Obasanjo really wanted to run with Atiku for the second term. But when the re-election was launched in 2002 by Chief Tony Aneni, who had by that time fallen out with Atiku Abubakar, the only thing they were talking about was an Obasanjo second term rather than an Obasanjo Atiku second term. And so Atiku too decided to distance himself a bit from the campaign. So after that campaign was launched, um, um, immediately, I think about that evening or the following evening, Tunji Osini, who was then, you know, one of the spokespersons of um, Chief Odisha Obasanjo, had to issue a clarification that, look, it's going to be an Obasanjo article ticket. A lot of people at that time within the polity were also egging Atiku also to run. But Atiku did not run in 2003. He helped Obasanjo to win a second term. It came, you know, for Obasanjo, he had to convince Atiku to support him because Atiku was friends with all the governors. Atiku was strong within the party. Now, but that was not the major break between them. The major break happened in 2007 at the end of Obasanjo's tenure. Rather than handing over to Atiku Abubakar, Obasanjo handed over to um, Umaru Musa Yaradua, who was a younger brother to Shehu Musa Yaradua. Based on his friendship with um, Yaradua, he handed over to um, Umaru Musa Yaradua rather than to Atiku himself. Um, personally, I believe that's where the politics of Nigeria went wrong because anybody who knew the Obasanjo um, 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 eight years, the eight years of uh, Chifolo, Shegu Obasanjo and Atiku it was a fantastic combination. It was a brilliant presidency. It was a lovely partnership. I mean, Obasanjo was going all over the world and doing stuff. Atiku had the real powers. He was working here in Nigeria and there was trust between them. There was respect between them. You know, even at the time when the Sharia crisis broke out, Atiku was the one who, who, you know, spoke with the governors and they came out with a press release and said, look, um, 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 for now, most of the states are, are suspending the implementation of Sharia. And then you had people like Muhammad Bwari, people like um, Shehu Shagari and the rest of them went and said, no, there was never such a discussion at the National Council of States meeting that they had. There was never such a discussion at that meeting and so on and so forth. The North kept on going against them. As a matter of fact, at that time, you know, um, when they went to Mecca, Atiku was the Amir of that particular delegation to Mecca and the 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 um, Sani Yerima group, you know, they mobilized people to boo him at Mecca and say that he was not a champion of Islam and so on and so forth. They had always used that against him. In any cases, at 2007, Obasanjo did not hand over to Atiku Abubakar as expected. He handed over to Maru Musaya Adua. Atiku went to the Action Congress, he contested, he lost. Um, he had been the one who led a, the the charge against. Um, at El Basanjo's third term agenda, and so he was frozen out of the political class in 2007. Umaru Musayadua got into office, and then his health, his health was bad, um, and all of a sudden he died in 2010. By the time he died in 2010, and Gulag Jonathan became the substantive president, the North felt, look, we now have to, Good luck, Jonathan should just serve out um, Umaru Musayadua's term. After serving out the term, um, let a northerner, let PDP field a northerner in 2011. The argument was that um, the South, the South had spent eight years in power through Olusha Gombasanjo, and now the South was about to have another eight years in power through um, Good Luck Jonathan. 
But the counter argument in 2011 was there were two major arguments. Number one, that if by the accident of history, the zone that produces the oil in Nigeria, which is the lifeline of Nigeria's economy, the zone that produces it now has a precedent for the first time in their history by an accident of history, then we should allow it to be. We should allow him to serve his own term substantively as a reward, you know, or, or to show a sense of unity for the entire country. That was the first argument. Now, the second argument, which I think also speaks to the present discussions that people have online about the idea of a southern Nigeria. The second argument was the histories, the histories of the peoples of the south is so diverse that you cannot equate the eight years of a Yoruba man with the eight years of a Niger Delta person. In other words, the history of Niger Delta is separate from the history of the Yoruba, separate from the history of the Igbos. So for you to say that because a southerner has served, and therefore that covers um, the Yoruba, the Niger Delta, the um, Igbos, it covers their tenure, it doesn't really, the argument doesn't really make sense. The people are distinct. Yoruba served eight years. It wasn't south per se. You know, so that was the argument at that time. But nevertheless, the North was not convinced. So as towards the 2011 election, you had a lot of people who came out um, in the North to contest. You had Ibrahim Badamusi Babangi that wanted to contest. Bukola Saraki, who was then the sitting governor of um, um, Kwara State, wanted to contest. Um, Ali Ugusa, General Ali Ugusa wanted to contest. And of course, Atiku Abubaka also wanted to contest. As a matter of fact, with Bukola Saraki, Shortly after the death of Umaru Musa Yadra, Bukola Saraki, who was the chairman of the NGF, the Nigerian Governors Forum, um, he held a meeting with the then chairman of the PDP, Prince Vincent Obulafo. They held a meeting, you know, the governors held a meeting with him and they asked what was the state of play as regards whether power was going to go to the north or whether this new president, Goodluck Jonathan, was going to recontest in 2011. And at the end of that meeting, Prince Vincent Obulafo made an announcement to the press that power was going to return to the north as was enshrined in the PDP constitution, section 7CA, I believe, section 7CA or 7C2, as at that time, as enshrined in the constitution, section 7CA, you know, which talks about the rotation of power and so on and so forth. May 2010 was that meeting. In that same month, Vincent Obulafo, you know, the good luck, Jonathan government brought up um, corruption cases against him and Vincent Obulafo had to resign as the PDP, as the PDP chairman. He was, he was pushed out, you know, so to speak. He was pushed out as chairman because, you know, his position was that power should return to the North in, in defense of fair play. And then Ukwesi Leze Mwodo was brought in. Um, 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 and then that particular section was now removed from the PDP constitution in order to prevent somebody from the North um, to um, be from becoming president. Now, the North was still trying all its best. They set up a committee um, called Northern Political Leaders Forum, MPLF, led by um, Alaji Adamu Chiroma. Um, now, Chiroma, they looked at the four candidates, four major candidates, and you know they eventually said, look, all the rest should step down. Atuka Baka is the best chance that the North has of going head to head with Good Luck Jonathan. But other stakeholders within the PDP were also working for Good Luck Jonathan, and they were meeting with people in the North also. And, you know, Northerners being um, majorly Muslims, the belief was that, look, if this is the will of God, if this is the will of Allah, that, you know, this man who was vice president should become president at this time, you know, with Yaradwa's death, then let's not move against it. Let's not move against it. Let's just let him go. And that argument really so. Besides, you know, the argument was that he's only going to serve one term. Now, Good Luck Jonathan himself declared that he was going to serve one term. He made that declaration in South Africa when he met with, first when he met with um, voters, with Nigerians in the diaspora. He met with them and in the course of their discussion, the, it was, he said that, he, he, he's sorry that they cannot vote in 2011, but that when he is elected in 2011, that by the next election, he would ensure that Nigerians in the diaspora can vote. That he would not be contesting in that election, but that he would ensure that they can vote in that election. Again, um, BBC and Reuters, in fact, they used that statement as a mockery because it was at an AU meeting. There was an AU meeting then going on in South Africa, and they used it as a mockery 
of other dictators in Africa, dictators like um, 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 Nasigbe Yadema, like Yoweri Museveni, Robert Mugabe, and all the rest of them, that look, if the African Union leaders could have listened to what Goodluck Jonathan was saying, that he would do only one term, rather than them spending one, two, three, four, five terms in office as they were doing at that time. BBC and Reuters carried it at that time, you know. So um, eventually when Goodluck Jonathan wanted to contest in 2015 and he started saying that he, he hadn't said that, um, I mean, some of us just looked at the preparations of the situation, but we understood, you know, that he was being, um, um, he wasn't entirely being um, forthright on that matter. In fact, Chief Olusha Gobasanjo, at the final rally of the PDP, um, at the grand rally of the PDP, he said it openly that Gulag Jonathan was only going to serve one term and that they would hold him to serving one term from 2011 to 2015. That, in fact, he, as the chairman of the BOT, had been mandated to speak with Atiku, to speak with Bukola Saraki, to speak with Gusau, to speak with IBB and all the rest who had contested, and he had spoken with them, and he had given them the commitment of the leaders of the party that this president that they were going to support was only going to serve one term from 2011 to 2015. Of course, Atiku Abubakar had by that time contested against Gulag Jonathan at the presidential primaries, and it was a very heavily contested um, presidential, um, presidential primaries. Atiku Abubakar came in with guns blazing, explained that, look, he had sacrificed so much for the party and he expected that, you know, this time around there's the principle of rotation which had now been deleted from the constitution and so on and so forth. Now, eventually, of course, contesting against a sitting president is only so much you can do. He managed to pull 805 votes, I believe, 805 or 806, no, 805. Gulag Jonathan had 2,736, I believe, 2,736 votes as against 805. Of course, that was a good fight from somebody against a sitting president. But after that, when, once Atiku lost, he campaigned for Gulag Jonathan because the agreement was one term. Okay, there was an agreement of one term. He campaigned, he went all out and campaigned for Good Luck Jonathan. But shortly after winning in 2011, by 2013, Good Luck Jonathan was already showing signs that he wanted a second term. Increasingly, um, different things, different ideas were being introduced to the party. You know, um, it, his men were moving to capture the party and it was becoming quite obvious. So everybody could see from his body language that he was going to contest um, uh, in 2015. And people could see it, that, you know, people could see from the body language that he intended to run for a second term. And a lot of reactions were going on, uh, even within the party at that time, you know, chairmen were being removed, you know, based on their stance, whether they were for um, his re-election or not, and so on and so forth. So all those things were going on within the political class. Um, in a lot of private conversations, of course, with um, some of the governors of the North, there was no written agreement for sure. But, you know, in politics, your word is your bond. And um, a lot of governors at the time, you know, said that he had told them, you know, that he wasn't going to run, you know, apart from speaking about it publicly in South Africa and then on campaign trails. And then when Obasanjo was also beside him saying, um, you know, saying that, um, that he was only going to run for one term. But, you know, I mean, he was president, um, and, and, you know, he had the powers, you know, basically to take over the party. But then, you know, your power to take over the party or your power to impose yourself on the party um, does not negate the power of others to leave the party, okay? So people started, some started leaving the party, especially when, you know, a particular um, PDP convention was very rancorous. I think it was one that produced Amanga Tuko. Um, it was very rancorous, you know, people felt they were being shot out and then they formed the NPDP, which eventually became part of the APC. It was a political reaction um, and a lot of them at that time left um, because, you know, they felt, look, we had a gentleman's agreement, you were only going to serve one term. How are we going to go back to campaign to our people that now you are going to do a second term? This is a betrayal. Um, this should be the slot of the North, so to speak. Um, and, you know, so, so that reaction was there. And Atiku was one of those people that left, you know, and, and Goodluck Jonathan um, essentially went ahead and contested that election. Atiku decided to pursue his um, aspiration elsewhere within another um, political circle, which was the APC, where he lost the presidential primaries to um, Muhammad Buhari, contested, Kwakwanso contested also, and I think was it um, Samunda Isaiah contested. And, you know, Muhammad Buhari won, and then they supported him also to win. 
um, which I'll come back to. But you know, it is where it is where the the question lies for some of us um, at my age um, and in our generation. It is understandable that we stand by the politics of ideology rather than politics as an engagement of aspiration. Um, because the aspiration is not ours in the first place. It's not yet ours. If I'm in this political association for a long period with my aspirations, whatever they are, and they keep on not being fulfilled but being betrayed, um, at some point I would have to reevaluate my membership or my commitment to that, um, to that political association. But for young people of our age, I mean, it's not your ambition, it's not your fight, it's not your squabble. You can understand, Obasanjo's um, reputation was on the line, so to speak. Yes, you know, at our age we believe that, look, they should have weighed the options carefully. But it was their ego, it was their, 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 it was the entirety of their being, it was their political careers, it was everything about them that was on the line, you know. Um, they felt betrayed, they felt hurt, and they left. You know, I mean, that's why I respect someone like Alaji Sule Lamido. Because he was aggrieved, but at the end of the day, he weighed the two political options um, and he felt that, you know, he should stick with the PDP and support Gulag Jonathan, which he did eventually. But again, at the 2019 presidential primaries, the people who were first, second, third, and fourth were all people who had left the PDP, gone to the APC, and returned to the PDP ahead of those who had stayed, the likes of Sule Lamido, David Mack, and the rest of them. That, you know, tells me that the political class understood the reason why they left. Everybody in PDP understood why they left, that these people left because they were aggrieved. And so the first was Atiku, the second was Tambuwal, the third was Saraki, I believe, the fourth was um, 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 Rabi Ukwaku, and so all returnees from the APC, the political class understood, which is the point that we are making here, that if it was your ambition that Goodluck Jonathan betrayed, if Goodluck Jonathan had done something, if he had given you his word and he, he, he betrayed it and then you looked at the options, article, you looked at the options, um, um, you looked at the options, Goodluck Jonathan, Buari, and you felt, you know, good luck, Jonathan, or Buari was better, and you went because of that betrayal, because of that anger, then, you know, we can say that, okay, you are somewhat justified, but it wasn't your fight. So, essentially, anybody in my generation who picked that battle, or who followed them, it was only a question of follow, follow politics, you know. We who chose to support good luck, Jonathan, despite knowing some of these things at that time, we did it as a matter of ideology and as a matter of principle, that a president is elected, to, is, 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 um, a president deserves, you know, he reserves the right to aspire for a second term after having served the first term. And then out of the principle that the option of Goodluck Jonathan was better than the option of Muhammadu Buhari. Again, this proves that our loyalty is, loyalty so to speak, in quotes, our loyalty is not to persons. If they live we would not necessarily live with them. What we believe in is fixed because we are at an age where we can play the engage politics as an engagement of ideology strictly rather than as an engagement of aspiration or ambitions. And so they are living, we stayed, believing in what we believed in and working for the person that we felt was the better option at that time. So it, 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 you know, it, it's clear to me logically that they left because they were aggrieved um, um, someone was trying to use his political powers against them, which is, you know, um, I mean, it happens in politics. I mean, at that time, in 2015, the PDP printed only one form for the presidential candidate, for the presidential race. They printed only one form, and that was for Gulag Jonathan. M.K. Wabiola's wife, um, Zainab, 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 um, she has a middle name, Zainab, Zainab Duke, Zainab Duke Abiola, she bought a form, she paid 2 million naira, which was the price that um, women um, pay, you know, she paid 2 million naira. Then um, Tafa Baliwa's son, Tafa Baliwa's son, Abdul Jalil, Abdul, Dr. Abdul Jalili, he, he paid 22 million naira to buy a form, 2 million naira for expression of interest, 20 million naira for the nomination form. He paid. By the time the two of them go to the PDP headquarters, 
they were told that only one form was printed, and that was the form for Gulag Jonathan because PDP wasn't interested in primaries. That was in how Obasanjo did it when Obasanjo did it in 2003. When Obasanjo wanted to run, Obasanjo made it look like the people wanted, like even the Northerners had bought into his agenda of a second term. It was the likes of El Rufai, it was the likes of Atiku Abubakar, it was the likes of Suli Lamid, Rabi Ukwa Kwanso, that were pushing the um, Obasanjo for second term agenda, you know, at least publicly. They were the ones, ones who, were, who were pushing it. And he didn't shut the field against anybody. Obasanjo, with all his, um, you know, stubbornness and all his braggado behavior, he did not shut the, the door against anybody. A Northerner wanted to contest against him. Abu Bakar Rimi, Rimi contested. Alex Ekwemi contested. Um, I think Mama Sarah Jubril contested. Um, who else was there? Um... You know, I forgot some of the names, but they were all there. That was the primaries where Obasanjo was sitting beside his wife and chewing cola nut. He couldn't sleep all night. He worked for it. He allowed the field to be free, at least openly free in public. But here was um, the reverse happening at this time. So it was a messed up political situation. But I also remember at that time, I think a few days to 2015 election, um, and I think, you know, um, um, some news websites, websites confirmed it. Um, that Gulag Jonathan paid a visit to Atiku Abubakar. Atiku Abubakar was in his house. He was sleeping at night, and then Gulag Jonathan came in, and you know, he said he was told that you know Atiku Abubakar. And this is public record. I haven't. Um, this is and, and this is public record. He was sleeping. You know, he was sleeping at that time, and um, Gulag Jonathan came in. He was told Gulag Jonathan was waiting for him downstairs. They had a discussion, you know, and they had a discussion, but he was still supporting APC. That was what he said. But shortly afterwards, I remember that in Ondo State, Governor Imiko welcomed um, the People's Democratic Movement, the PDM, which was the initial platform of Atiku. He welcomed them. They were defecting from the APC to the PDP and saying that they would support Gulag Jonathan. Not only that, about 120 support groups um, of, you know, 2120 support groups of Atikus where they declared, you know, that they would support Gulag Jonathan instead in Abuja. They were welcomed at the Shehu Musaya Adra Center. They were welcomed by um, um, the present national chairman of PDP, then the deputy national chairman, Prince Uche Sekondos. He was the one who welcomed them. You know, Atiku supporters were defective. So we don't really know what happened there. But outwardly, what we know is what we know. In other words, that Atiku supported Muhammad Buhari in 2015. But for me, it was as a result of an understandable um, political agreement that was breached which in his case, you know, he must have felt it was one too many. He had been accused several times, right from the time of Abio, MK Wabiola to the time of Ulushe Gwaba Sonjo. Um, he, had been, he had faced the accusation that he, he, wasn't, um, um, he wasn't using his, his, his political clout to defend the interest of the North, that, you know, he always seemed to sell out to the North. Of course, it also happened, it was used against him in 2011, after he lost to Goodluck Jonathan at the PDP presidential primaries, that, you know, he should have supported Muhammad Buhari at that time, but he did not, you know, and the argument that they made to the people was that Goodluck Jonathan has committed to a one-term deal. Four years is not, is not too much for us to allow him to um, to preside. He is from the Niger Delta. You know, they made all those arguments to their people. By 2015, I mean, how were you going to go back to go and say what we said four years ago, um, we are not saying it again, and so on and so forth, especially when, um, you know, you when you perceived that the person who was um, then in power was not um, even, you know, making attempts to, you know, um, to seduce you or to romance you or to carry you along so to speak you know so 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 for me there's um, a logical consistency there if you look at it from that perspective politics as an engagement of ideology and politics as an engagement of um, aspiration or ambition ideology or ideals if you like people of my generation had no business um, supporting Muhammadu Buhari against Goodluck Jonathan based on the evidence and on the records of both men those who had grievances with um, Good Luck Jonathan, the likes of Ulisha Gwamba Sojo, the likes of Atuka Ubaka, the likes of Kwa Kwanso, the likes of um, 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 Rotimia Mechi, and all the rest of them, Atuka Ubaka, and all the rest of them, Kola Saraki, you know, they, um, they had reasons 
but their reasons were not my reasons. The interest that we pursued at that time was the ideal, which is what I believe everybody in this generation should have done. But then again, I mean, at the end of the day, the whole question is, um, for me, it's just a learning experience for us to learn from what happened in 2015. I'm not in support of, you know, um, continually um, going over and over it. Of course, you know, sometimes, and perhaps I'll address that in another video, sometimes when you look at the mess that Nigeria is in now and the mess that all of us, you know, have to suffer as a result of one man becoming president in 2015, you wonder, you know, why did people make those mistakes that they made? So we understood why um, some of those leaders, political leaders, supported, but people in our generation um, will continue to query, you know, what evidence they saw that this person who is now the president was a reform democrat as at the time that that he became um, as at the time that they supported him to become president um, there's also something else to note and that is that every generation usually holds its own to account for the misdeeds of any government every generation usually holds its own to account for the misdeeds of any government so in the government of Muhammad Buhari, for instance, um, we might we would look at the young people who are in that government and say that where were you when Twitter was banned? Why was your voice not loud? This was your stand before you went into government. This is your this when this was happening when you were in government. You know um, what did you say? And that will follow them for quite a while through their political trajectory or through their public life career. You know, so that happens. I mean, it happened also to Patutomi. Patutomi was a special advisor in the government of um, Shewu Shagari, and his generation still, you know, looks at him through that lens. They see him as the man who was responsible for some of the things that the Shagari government did. So it's normal, you know. Um, our generation is not going to go on and on about Buhari or about who supported Buhari from other generations, but people in our generation, I guess, would, um, you know, always be questioned about that 2015. Um, decision, you know, um, they would always be questioned about it. It's 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 what happens, you know. It's what happens in politics. So, I hope that I've been able to explain or throw some light on the issues around this. Um, that's the aim of this. That's the aim of this, um, and I hope that you know that 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 aim has been achieved um, uh, quite well. That aim has been achieved quite well. I'm sorry, this took a bit longer than I thought. I thought I would do just 30 minutes. Sorry, it took about 45 minutes. But thank you very much for watching. I appreciate it. Um, do subscribe to YouTube. I will try and post more and more in the days to come, you know, in the months to come, so that we can continue to shed light on political issues as best as we can. But um, those of you who follow me on Twitter, I look forward to engagement on this topic um, and other topics as the polity continues. So, Thank you very much for watching and um, I'll see you again soon.